I mean, I always thought big before skateboarding. I see things, and the things that I see, sometimes people don't believe me. When I first started skating, people laughed at me and didn't think I was going to make it. When I started my first company, people had said, it's not going to work. And I didn't heard that so many times, but I'm still here. He's a black professional skateboarder. He's the black entrepreneur. Stevie built his legacy from nothing. Stevie represented the underdog. Growing up in Philly, all of this conditioning of my neighborhood, which was, you know, don't trust the white man. The blacks was against him from hanging with the white people down in Love Park. Do they really want to talk about that? Love Park, Stevie and Kayla's own that place. They put Philly back into the spotlight. He just got better at his craft, better at being a pro. You got your face on a shoebox? It was crazy. He said he wanted to start a company. And I was like, what are you going to call it? He said, DGK. Are you sure you want to call it that? That name represents something. One of the most authentic brands. And there was rappers that were wearing it. DGK! DGK and Stevie have crossed so many boundaries. He's the GOAT. Growing up in North Philly, like, I just remember nobody was rich. It just was tough growing up, and you had to share, and you had to just do things and grow up fast. In 1987, 1988, was huge crack era. It was normal for me to see things, a lot of raids, a lot of crack raids. I remember seeing that, you know what I mean? And people fighting. You just got to watch your back and just make sure you got some heart. That's, that's Philly. My mom, she raised me the best that she could. He's my only child, yes, indeed. I turned 21 when I had him. I was raising him as a single mother. It was hard for him. My dad, he was in and out of the picture in my life. Him and my mom got divorced, and after that divorce, he got remarried. So he had another family. And, you know, as a young boy, the last thing you want to see is somebody hurt your mom. And at that point, I figured, like, you know what? I'm gonna have to pick up the pieces. He saved me, you know what I'm saying? He really did. It was me and him, against the world. The neighborhood I'm from, back then, the only thing you could do was sell crack. You wanna become, you know, one of the dudes on the corner to sell crack, so you become cool. It's the norm. People wasn't really talking about what college they going to. They talking about what car they gonna drive or what kind of clothes they gonna have. I looked up to that, I wanted that too. You know, that's just the culture of growing up in Philly and growing up in the street. I came home from school one time. I was around 10. My mom was like, look, it's time to go. We was in my sister's spot. It was, it was dangerous, very dangerous. Anybody in their right mind wouldn't want to live in that type of atmosphere. And I wanted to take Stevie away, so I moved them to West Philly. Coming from North Philly to West Philly, I felt like I had something to prove. Got into a lot of fights, and then just wandering around the neighborhood. And I would see this black dude riding a skateboard. That was Roger Brown. And I'm like, damn, that's cool. I had a skateboard, because my cousin Kev bought me one. And I had the Bruce Lee cheesy one that was, you know, the wheel stop. And I went up to him and I was like, yo, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to learn how to jump in the air. And he was just like, no, nah, you can't do that with that skateboard. I was like, damn, what kind of, and he showed me a real pro looking skateboard that I've never seen before. I never even heard you can have a pro skateboard. And that's when everything started. I would just be around and I seen Rasul and my man Terrence riding a skateboard too. So I used to ask them, let me ride your skateboard. First time I saw Stevie was on Powelton Avenue. Roger Brown lived on Powelton Avenue too as well. In the home, my home, well actually it was John Puka. I met Terrence, he was a sharp looking guy. This other kid named Sharif. We used to see him with my cousin, Rachel. He was with my man Shaheed. Big up to Shaheed. Because they used to go to the same school. They too lived on Powerton Avenue too. I think my grandma and his grandma knew each other. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I would always try to get people into skateboarding so I could have somebody to learn with. 
Because before then, I didn't know anything about no love parking, no nothing. I'm skating in the projects, yo, by myself. We always looked at Steve back then like he was like a little troublemaker. We see who you hanging out with. <laughs> I see what you're doing. He's telling me stories. Yo, what you been doing? Oh, I got into a fight with this guy. You know what I mean? And Steve came along and he, you know, he, we taught him how to ollie. And yeah, he, he learned pretty fast. He learned in one day how to ollie. I was always looking at a skateboard, but I never really looked at it how I looked at it after I did the ollie. And everybody that does their first little ollie, that's one of the best feelings in the world. Stevie did the trick. And it must have tricked something in his head because from that point on, whew, he was flying. Almost where I could control him. Rasul and Terrence start coming over to my house. When I seen a skateboard tape, I was just derailed by that. Back then, skateboarding tapes was playing a bunch of punk rock music, so we had to turn it down and play our music because my mom and them in, in the other room would think we in there listening to some devil worshiping stuff. And the door opened up so fast. What are you here watching? Like, oh, shit. like, I seen other black kids. I seen Asian kids. I seen crazy looking white kids, and they was everywhere. Rasul would tell me that they in different cities. It was just like, yo, what's going on? Like, you can ride a skateboard in California. And it was just so many questions on like, well, how do you do that? And it's like, oh, you got to get sponsored. And then it's like, you get sponsored because you get good and then people, they'll give you money and you can travel around the world. And I was like, what? You could travel around the world by riding a skateboard and they give you money? He was like, yeah, if you get sponsored. That was it. I want to be a pro skater. What I got to do to do that? Terrence and Rasul, they was already going to Love Park. I thought it was called Left Park, so I ain't know where the hell it was. But see, my man Sean, he sold drugs. And he was like, yo, I'm gonna take you downtown. I looked over, I'm like, what you doing here? Steve's like, I'm, I'm here, he pointed. I looked over and it's Sean. I'm like, oh man, oh man, it's about to go down. Love Park was this granite plaza pretty much a city block big. It had different levels and it had different size granite ledges. I mean, it was like a street skateboarder's dream spot, you know? Some people recognize it as just a place to skate. I don't want to spend too much time there because it all ends up looking the same. But some people looked at it as your home away from home. You build a, a life there. Terrence and Rasul, they was already going to Love Park. I thought it was called Left Park, so I ain't know where the hell it was. But they didn't really want me to come down to Love Park yet. You know, he's a wild kid. If he's rolling with us and we get into a <laughs> little scuffle, Steve's gonna go all the way out of his way to protect his friend. So we never really wanted to bring him around certain things that he didn't understand yet. Back then, like I was all into like, you know, revolutionary stuff, like, like my family, you know what I mean? Don't trust the white man, fight the power, like all of this type of conditioning of my neighborhood, which was, you know, it was normal. Rasul was like, yo, nah, yo, you can't do that, yo. If you wanna be a skater, you gotta be open. You gotta, you gonna meet white people, you gonna meet all types of people. And I wasn't really tripping on what he was talking about, really. And maybe that is one of the reasons why he didn't bring me down there. But see, my man, Sean, was from the hood, he sold drugs. And he was like, yo, I'm gonna take you downtown. He had this crazy beat up car, took me down there. You're 11 years old, downtown. When I seen the love sign, once I seen that, <laughs> it was a rat. I looked over, I'm like, what you doing here? Steve like, I'm, I'm here when you point I looked over and it's Sean. I'm like, oh man, oh man, he's about to go down, yo. They were pretty rough, man. Big Sean was rough. Because Big Sean was the main dude who robbed dudes for boards back in the day. If you were skating Love Park and you had a brand new setup and nobody knew who you were, you might get knocked up inside your head and your board taken. I don't know, man. It was like the wild, wild west. <laughs> I'm glad I was friends with him because I never got robbed. Oh, Sean is laughing. <laughs> he had got three boards that day. He got like two for himself and one for Steve. I'm shaking my head, but I'm like, all right, well, now you can skate. Love used to be crowded. It used to be like 50 skaters there. It was basically legal to skate there. Anywhere in the city that you skated, if you were getting kicked out, they would tell you to go to Love. 
That day when I first went down there, you know, it was black, it was white, it was Asian, Puerto Rican, all together, just chilling, hanging out, drinking from the same Wawa iced tea cup. It's just all for this little cult thing that we into. At that time, just breaking barriers as a young kid of you thinking certain things need to be a certain way, it drew me in that much more to say, damn, like, I'm proud to be a part of this. Because it was positive, you know? And then where we going back home to the hood, I'm not saying it's negative, it's just that the circumstances is different. When I went down there to Love Park, finally I'm like, okay, let me go see what this boy doing. Everybody was, you know, cool. Everybody was looking out for each other. It was a, a community, it was like a family. And I was so proud of that he had joined something like that. But the neighborhood didn't agree with who he was and what he was doing. He got a beat down in school. It was so bad. They would fight him every day in school, you know, for hanging with the white people down in Love Park. They like, yo, why are you changing on us? Look what you got on or you want to act just like them, you know, that ain't for us. So got into a lot of fights and <laughs> the way skateboarders dressed back then, of course you would get laughed at. Every day, every day. I just prayed that they wasn't going to kill him. I was a skater and proud of it, no matter what nobody said, because it was special. And I wasn't giving that special feeling up for nobody. It was, I'm a part of this thing that nobody's a part of and I'm really good at it. He progressed real fast. It was pretty amazing to watch. It seemed like a lot of tricks came to him easy. Stevie was like a natural. Stevie was just fun to be around, you know? I mean, he was a few years younger than me, but we both had kind of a similar mentality on what we liked doing. Terrence and Rasul, and there was a nice little squad that rolled around with Stevie. That's kind of who I gravitated towards, you know? Philadelphia at the time was like broken up in different like little skate crews, you know, and it's like a mini society. People try to create rules and, you know, there would be beefs. So we were just trying to fit into the culture of skateboarding, man. Skateboarders, I don't think they're too territorial, they're just clicky. There was like the DGK click and like, you know, the daggers. These guys did a lot of wallies and wall rides, and Stevie just skated completely different. He was way more technical, and I don't think people like understood or appreciated his style of skateboarding as much as they probably should have. When people started recognizing that these young kids were like the dope ones, the older crew, they didn't want to give up that control. The perception that they were like the illest in Philly, and so it seemed like there was some blocking going on. very first time a media company came to Philadelphia to do an article, they were shooting pictures of Stevie and his guys, and the other side straight up told Transworld, don't shoot those kids, they're just dirty ghetto kids. And that's where the name was born. They insisted that we had to be in that because we was the kids, the only kids skating down there from Philly. You go back and look at that picture, there's a bunch of guys from New Jersey. All these other guys who claim they from Philly, I never seen these dudes when I was growing up. We would have met, we would have ran into them. It was really no chance of any of me and my homies getting sponsored until Jeff Pang came to Love Park. Jeff Pang skated for Underwear Element and I was on him. I was like, yo, I want to get sponsored. How do I get sponsored? I'm good enough to get sponsored. Do you got a camera? You got a camera? Oh, let's film. And he wound up filming me because there was nobody there at that time to tell him Oh, uh, you don't want to take photos of them. I oh, don't film them. They just dirty ghetto kids. They're not doing nothing. But it took somebody like Jeff to be like, yeah, I feel me. You know what I mean? And he told me how to get sponsored. He put a good word in. And next thing you know, I was sponsored by Element at 12 years old. And I think that got a lot of people mad too. Stevie, the little dude from West Philly, is not supposed to be getting sponsored by no damn Underworld Element skateboards. And who the hell let that happen? And that's when I realized, like, it's about talent, traveling, it's about networking. You just gotta go out there and do it. That's why I left the city of Philly and I ran away to California. At 14. I'm looking all over for him, no Stevie. We just hopped on a road. We made it to so many different states. 
Steve went to California. Oh my God. The way the other crews treated Steve and their crew was like, they were just bullies almost. In my opinion, it was pretty disrespectful. I was sponsored by Element at 12 years old. I wasn't letting none of those dudes tell me that I couldn't be who I wanted to be. I wanted to turn pro, and that's why I left the city of Philly. Those dudes were more kind of like town heroes than they were professionals. But nobody was coming to look at the professionals in Philly, they was coming to check out Love Park. And that's when I realized like, it's about talent, traveling, it's about networking. You just gotta go out there and do it if you're gonna be a professional. So I left. At 14, I had a plan though. My homie Pat Washington said, yo, if you ever come to San Francisco, you can stay at my house. So I said, like, I'm gonna take you up and I'm on my way out there. We had $20, some clothes, some food. So I took the bus from Philly to DC. I locked in with my homie Jimmy Pelletier. We had this master plan that we was going to hitchhike to San Francisco. When I get out there, I can stay at Pat House, I can skate, I can turn pro, I can know all of these other pros. Much as we wanted a little piece of the industry to be out here on the East Coast, at the end of the day, all the brands, all the companies, they're in California. And these hood dreams, like, and I don't know any other skater from the hood that dream like this and actually go do it. We found some random skater dude right. in DC. But he had a brand new 1995 Ford Espire and sold him this crazy skate dream, driving to California and we all gonna get sponsored. And I was just, you know, just running it, you know? And the funny thing, his name was John Wayne. And I was like, well, his name John Wayne? Oh, we definitely out, you know what I mean? John Wayne take it across the country on a horse, you know what I mean? He was like, yeah, dude, I'll do it. And then we just hopped on the road. If we would've got pulled over, and I was a runaway. Those dudes that got charged with kidnapping. John Wayne just kidnapped a little black kid from the hood and tried to take him to California. And we made it to so many different states, stopped and skated, Dallas, Louisiana, Arizona. I seen like my first cactus. It was dope. Never been anywhere really outside of Philly. We get all the way to San Francisco and then we found Pat Washington. And he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, yo, you said I can crash. He was like, yeah, I was just playing like I'm homeless. Oh my God. He's like, well, I could show you where to put your clothes. And then you just got to kind of take it from there. At this time, I'm on Christmas break. I'm totally in school. I'm looking all over for him. No Stevie. So now I'm panicking. So his boy, Rasul, finally comes and says, Steve went to California. Oh my God. No, I didn't call my mom at all. I had to plan to not talk to her until I got to San Francisco. I was just gonna pop up and say, I'm here. You don't know nothing. I didn't teach you nothing. How is he surviving? How is he living? This is a dangerous world. I said, I'm coming to get you. I was gonna get the ticket on Amtrak, but I only had my job and I was paying electric gas for I doing the whole nine yards, so I didn't have no money. So I had to support him with faith. 14, Frisco, on my own, homeless. A lot of nights sleeping on the streets, a lot of nights sleeping in abandoned cars, learning how to finesse hotel lobbies, trade, barter, just thinking to myself like, damn, Steve, like, what are you, what are you doing, dog? You just go home. And if for some reason I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I needed to complete something in my life and I just kept going. Pat, he took me to my homie Shelby house that lived in the Tenderloin, and every skater that I seen in all the videos, they was all there. Spencer Fujimoto, Lee Smith, Carl Watson, Ben Sanchez, Mike York, like everybody was there. And they was like, oh wait, you little Stevie? I'm like, yeah, they're like, oh, well, we heard about you. Like, and they all just embraced me like I was one of theirs. What? <laughs> It was cool and we all went skating. And I made everything from that. I had left Philadelphia. I would see Stevie in San Francisco all the time. So we got to continue and build our relationship. I got to see him just messing around with the board and, and doing stuff and that's some of my favorite things.
San Francisco is such a small place that when someone shows up from out of town, whether it's Philly or New York or wherever, you're like, oh, what's up with this guy? As soon as I saw him at the pier, I was like, this kid's dope. Style is very important in skateboarding. And that just came through in photos and in footage. How he dressed and how he carried himself. How he rolled away from things, all that. So it was all so sick. I got kicked off Element because they already heard I wanted to skate for Henry Sanchez's new company. And at that time, I didn't know anything about business. So Element was up here. Henry Sanchez's new company was down here. But everything that came with Henry Sanchez's new company was something that made me who I am today. While I was a runaway, the things that I leaned on was more friendship and value and loyalty and trust. The people that I learned how to survive with is the people that I wanted to be with. Then profile went out of business. That hurt. It's so easy as a black dude to give up on skating because the industry don't play out in our favor. It's colorless because it's a universal sport anybody can do. But then the industry is ran by all suburban adults that don't understand what it's like to grow up in the inner city. They may have been scared of coming to the inner city. And it boils down to like, people look at skateboarding like it's a suburban sport, but skateboarding is just as urban as it is suburban. But nobody gives the urban a chance because urban doesn't get a chance. So nothing popped for me in SF. I didn't really see no future for me in the skateboard industry because there was no me getting on no major companies anymore. The friends that I have won't be the sponsored type. It was damn near a wrap. You done skated since you was a 10 years old to try to impress all of these people to get sponsored, and then they don't want to sponsor you. At that age, it was like, you know what? I'd rather just go home and kick with my homies. In Philly, none of my homies, they all stopped skating. We all started drinking around that time, stealing from the store, trying to figure out what we gonna do and where we gonna sleep at. I was like, is this dude possibly on his way out? You know, this one, this one was at like the height of Josh and Stevie, I love, you know. This one's super important to me. Steve, that was DGK right there, you know. It just speaks everything to me about what we've done. In Philly, none of my homies, they all stopped skating. They started rapping graffiti, getting in more trouble. We all started drinking around that time, stealing from the store, trying to figure out what we gonna do and where we gonna sleep at. There was no me getting on no companies anymore. It was damn near a wrap. I decided to move back to Philly because it had been a couple years and I wanted to see what was going on. So I went back. And when I got to Philly, man, I was just like, I miss this place. Love was like empty. And the guys that dissed Stevie, us, they weren't there anymore. I was like, this place is wide open right now. It was like me and Stevie, we could do this. We could finish what we were starting. I was on Market Street and I walked past the bus stop and Stevie and I think Booze was his name were in there just faded. And I was like, yo, and he's like, yo, what's up? We're looking all over for you, where you at? I'm like, I'm just chilling right here. He's like, chilling, doing what? I'm like, oh, we just drinking. I was like, is this dude possibly on his way out from the skate game? And I mean, he was young. It just didn't seem like he was in a spot that he could be in, you know? He was like, yo, I got a crib. I'm like, oh, that's what's up. He was like, I want you to start skating again. If you skate, you can stay at the house. I got a room for you. And I'm like, oh, you serious though? And he was. Josh, he's my godson, I love him to death. If it wasn't for Josh putting him in that apartment, I don't know how my son would have turned out. Josh said, I seen talent in you, and you shouldn't waste it. I love Josh. Nothing doesn't hurt. She gave me the good luck, remember? He's a good human being for seeing something in myself that I didn't see. 
But I don't think I felt like it was like saving Stevie. None of us felt like that really with our own friends. You know, I was in a position to offer an opportunity, but it was up to him, you know, if he wanted to take it or not. He skated with me every single day until I got back. Josh was very established. That was Josh Kalis. DC, Drawers, Alien Workshop, East Coast, West Coast, Cover Trans World. He was the truth. And when I was able to really get my legs back, he was like, yo, you should go to Cali. He actually gave me a stamp. So when I went back out to California, skateboarding just opened up for me. I went out and filmed a crazy sponsor me tape, and I was shopping it to nothing but the best. If I'm gonna go back, I wanted to give it my best shot. And that's what I did. And that shot got me on chocolate. To shoot for that type of company is like shooting for the stars. If you landed on that, you good. I took that money and went back to Philadelphia. And me and my mom got a house off of my uncle Nate in West Philly. And that's when I started my second wind of my career. TV got on Chocolate and EC, which was huge for us because, you know, myself, Stevie, and Love Park as a unit, it was unstoppable. It was ours. It wasn't nobody in the way. No town heroes trying to tell us what we can and can't do. All of the old dudes, they can't even come in the park no more. It's a change of guard. We controlled that whole thing. It took a couple years, but dude, it blew up huge. All the homies are still there, and now the new kids is coming. People were coming in and moving into Philadelphia from all over the place. Ryan Winning, Papa Lotto, Tim O'Connor. We had Mike Blayback coming out shooting us. We got filmers, we got photographers. Josh, and I think he had it all planned out in his mind. Like, I'm gonna go back to Philly, get with Steve, and we're gonna blow Love Park up. Doing that really brought Stevie to the world. Stevie and Kalis put Philly sort of back into the spotlight. To me, that era, the Stevie and Josh era is the real era for skateboarding at Love Park. Now the West Coast is coming to Philly, and all you had to do is just come in the mix and skate and respect the people. If you could do that, then you could skate Love Park. The guys that dissed Stevie, us, you guys showed everybody what you think it should look like, but now you're not here, and we're gonna show you what we think love should look like. Everybody in Love Park is on the same agenda of getting Philly on the map. That's what it's about, putting your spot on the map and having people drool over skating the spot that we made famous. Still to this day, Love Park is, is epic because of what we all put in, not just me and Kavis. I first started going out to Love Park working for DC Shoes. Ken Block was like, you're gonna be spending a lot of time in Philly. I just was there to document as much as I possibly could. We wanted Stevie to really represent the style of skateboarding and the style of shoes that we were making, like at the highest level, at the, in the coolest way. I was kind of growing into my own as a photographer. So I'd always experiment and, you know, I'd always, hey, can we shoot portraits? Can we do this? Can we do that? Stevie was always like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. We knew that Stevie was having a shoot coming out on DC. What was his ad gonna be? Like, what tricks are he gonna film? And I remember throwing that print onto Ken's desk. I remember Ken looking at it and just laughing. He was like, that's his ad. I was like, yeah, put that, put that everywhere. They put a photo of me in my face, on my box. They put it everywhere around the whole city of San Francisco doing X Games. It made people look at me. Everybody else had a trick. Oh, what's your trick for your shoe ad? They just used my face. And I sold millions of dollars worth of shoes, yeah. That's when things really changed as far as like lifestyle. Josh and Stevie were on top, top selling boards and shoes. Everyone around the globe knew who those guys were. Stevie and Josh went from like the Honda Civic to like BMWs. Kalis was coming through with the BMW. He had the nice cribs. It made me get my own stuff. Yeah, I bought a Range Rover off of Kalis. And that's when I knew like, oh, this is popping. Because people around my way was like, how the hell he got a Range Rover? 
Hip hop and urban culture was a little bit different back then. If you got that success, you just wanted to like double middle finger all the haters and it was like, y'all had doubts, but look at me now, you know? And, and Stevie just like, he has that anyway. So you add the success onto it and it's just that much doper, you know? How was that, Steve? Sorry. I was homeless and broke. And then next thing you know, I'm holding bottles of champagne, pushing Range Rovers, buying $400,000 houses with no manager, damn near no dad or somebody to say, no, this is how you handle money. You know, I, I didn't even have a grip on my life. I learned everything on the fly. I got my mom to take care of. And at that time, I had a daughter. It was another decision for me to say, OK, well, I could keep wilding out and celebrating or I could be a dad and change my life. After getting all of these things and then having friends like Colin McKay, Rob Derdick, and seeing how much of the entrepreneur these dudes were, it was like, yo, that's my next step. I want to be an entrepreneur too. He had a blank board one day and I was like, what are you doing? Leaving chocolate is like leaving the Lakers. When we had the meeting to do the deal, my partner asked me what I wanted to call my company. I was like, are you sure you want to call it that? The Philly scene blew up huge. People were coming in and moving into Philadelphia. A lot of people started their careers at Love Park. And throughout all that, it was hella illegal. It wasn't like 93 where you were getting kicked out of other spots and getting sent to Love Park. It was the opposite. Cops coming in, undercovers coming in. People were getting robbed by the cops, guns pulled out on by the cops, beat up by the cops. Love Park was super illegal to skate. Once I paid that $300 fine, I'm like, I'm never getting caught up here again. It gets to the point where if somebody moves real fast next to you, like, yeah, you're thinking about dipping. But we still, like, we still put it down. 2001, I started traveling the world with chocolate in D.C. Being on the road allowed me to meet and see all types of kids from around the world that really rock like me. And a lot of them I met let me know that I gave them inspiration to be themselves. So. I was so on fire, selling so much product. I think Stevie's life really started to change because people were recognizing how dope he was. The way he carried himself, the way he talked, the way he skated, people, they liked that. Stevie moves the needle. He's gonna create sales. And so in return, they're gonna wanna keep boosting him and he's gonna wanna keep doing it too because it's life changing. Stevie was on top, top selling boards and shoes. Everyone around the globe knew Stevie. Because of who he was and how talented he was and how he looked in photos and how he looked in footage, just that's why he blew up. That's why I had that grenade chain on. <laughs> I'm making millions of dollars and it just made me question like sales. It was like, yo, that's my next step. I want to be an entrepreneur. I moved back to the West Coast to Los Angeles. And that's when one of my good friends, Eli, he was like, yo, I think you should do your own company. I got a hookup if you want to do it. We wound up meeting my partner to this day, Troy Morgan, and we sat down with him and he explained to me all of the possibilities that I could have if I owned my own skateboard company. And that meeting that we had, I left thinking I could do this, so. I remember he had a blank board one day and I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, it's this new thing I'm doing. And I was like, what? Like, and I remember tripping on the fact that he was contemplating leaving a brand like Chocolate. Leaving Chocolate is like leaving the Lakers. You know what I mean? So it was like, how can you do that? It was like, whoa. Chocolate was like one of the top dogs, you know? And to start his own thing is extremely risky. When we had the meeting to do the deal, my partner asked me what I wanted to call my company. I said, DGK. He's like, yeah, we're going to call it that. He's like, are you sure you want to call it that? 
He's like, nah, yeah, we're gonna call it that. And I was like, all right. Even though the name could be a little inappropriate. <laughs> we talked for like two days. I remember us telling him that we're not dirty ghetto kids. But at the end of the day, I had to come around to the fact that that's a reality. That name represents something. That name represents the struggle. They think dirty ghetto kids are nothing, but we are something. I'm sure there was doubters and there always is though, you know? When he created DGK as a board company, yeah, I knew it would work out for him. It is the most authentic brand in all of skateboarding. There's a real story to it. DGK was born from Love Park, from somebody hating on Stevie and his crew. They didn't label themselves Dirty Ghetto Kids. Somebody else did. I just had a little small vision. I'm like, I could put my homies on. My best friend, Marcus McBride, Henry Sanchez, a crew of other dudes that compliment us, that I know that I could rock with, that, that may not be as big as me, but it's on the same level of talent as me, and we can show that we a squad. It was no disrespect to chocolate. I just thought it was a part of my destiny to skate with my homies and go on the road with my homies. We can do and say whatever we want to say and feel as comfortable as we need to feel because when you get on here, you better be you. I feel like when that company came out, like everyone was pretty surprised. It was something completely different than anything else at the time. DGK hit from the jump. It was like, this is the team, this is the idea behind the brand. It was super relatable, especially for that time period with a lot of urban skateboarders. A lot of things happened so fast. I signed a seven-figure deal with Reebok. We had the DGK Skate Park in Atlanta, Georgia. Lil Wayne learned how to skate there. Justin Bieber skated there. Wiz Khalifa, Gucci Man, Ludacris shot videos in there. It was always me and DGK trying to push the culture in inner city through skateboarding, through fashion, and pop culture. DGK was absolutely everywhere. Seeing Stevie in the Tony Hawk games. DGK and Stevie have crossed so many boundaries. DGK! It's still here and it's still cracking. No, people did not believe in DGK. Not one bit at all. Where they at now? That's how I look at it. 2009, I was on my way out from the company I was skating for because the company I was riding for had lost its way. I was actually asking Stevie for advice on what direction he think I should take. And I think in that conversation, it was just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I not riding for DGK? It's like, damn, I never thought about that. And then it just started rolling out. And the Josh and Stevie story, why don't we just complete the whole thing? And Stevie was like, yeah, let's do it. Going to DGK felt awesome. It was like, this is where I should have been since the beginning. Kalis is an original dirty ghetto kid from Philly. He was always on our side. And that's where it all goes back full circle to when I stopped skating. He gave me a room at his apartment and the deal was I could stay there for free if I skated. He skated with me every single day. If I didn't get that chance, I'd be still right with my homies trying to figure out what we gonna do and where we gonna sleep at. I love Josh. He's a good human being for seeing something in myself that I didn't see. We did a DGK movie in 2012. The first movie that DGK done, we did it our way. And then next thing you know, DGK getting the best team. Oh, and it is, it's the DGK. best team. There isn't any other team like DGK in the whole skateboard industry. There's no other African-American skateboard company owner like myself that has a dominant skateboard team. I like to pride myself on that. We come from the hood, and I can tell anybody in the hood, I own a skateboard company, and it's top five. <laughs> you feel me? Top five. At a time where I'm supposed to be this Stevie Williams dude, I was questioning myself, what the hell am I doing? He started to realize he didn't have the support that he really needed. 
these things were hitting me heavy. DGK represents people who came from nothing. Represents inner city street kids from all walks of life. Doesn't matter if you're African American, Caucasian, Asian, Latino. It's talking about kids who have nothing. Just like me and Stevie. That kid came from nothing. Comes from an environment that's set up to destroy you, but made it out. I think Stevie had a different idea for what he wanted to do with DGK. I created a brand called Asphalt Yacht Club, which was something different from DGK because fashion and skateboarding was coming together. So when AYC came along, he had the opportunity to try to make like a luxury brand for the streets. When you start another business and you're trying to push in a whole nother industry, you gotta kind of, you know, you gotta start mingling in a different kind of world. I was just really trying to just be successful, trying to push the culture in the city. That was his whole mission, taking it to another platform, to, to be able to sit next to somebody like Jay-Z and say, this is what we do, skateboarders. We move the streets just as much as you do. But when you get around a bunch of people who are not skateboarders, and don't understand the culture of skateboarding, then that's where it gets a little rough around the edges, man. I think he got caught up in between that. I went back to Philadelphia on tour one time. Me and my homie wound up walking into Love Park. I didn't even know where I was walking. And when we stopped at the fountain, I just started like bawling, crying. Man, I probably cried for like a good 20 minutes. And I couldn't really shake it. I didn't know where it was coming from. It was heavy. Love Park is gone. My whole childhood was gone. I was questioning myself, what the hell am I doing? Asphalt Yacht Club is doing bad. Stevie Williams is getting old. Love Park is gone. These things were hitting me heavy. At a time where I'm supposed to be this Stevie Williams dude, and I just couldn't. He started to realize he didn't have the support that he really needed. You can't be around a bunch of people that just want to be around you just because you're Stevie Williams or a celebrity. Those things left me depressed. Those things left me questioning myself. I couldn't even get an ollie off the ground with so much weight. I felt like I lost myself in success. Money didn't make my personality. It just got me into places that I've never been before. But I've been there and my homies ain't there. So I decided to let everything go. I stopped chasing bread, I stopped chasing deals, I stopped chasing everything. And I got back with my family and my friends. And what I wanna do right now is be a dad, grow, and learn how to be a better human being. I did a lot and it made a lot of money, but back in the day, 1995, 96, it wasn't about no money. It was just doing it for the love. How much fun I had and what I was doing and how creative I was. That's my motivation. And that's where I'm at. Seeing my son skate, I love seeing him like really progress. Skating at Jaquan with the homies. It's a whole new generation of kids out there that I would love to skate with. When I get on that board and I do my thing, no matter if I got all of the money in the world or not, I'm happy. The universe is gonna give back what you put in. Started Save by Skateboarding, which is a nonprofit. We give them complete skateboards to the inner city kids. Well, it's the favelas in Brazil, the projects at Nicholson Garden out here in LA. We actually come to your neighborhood. I grew up in South Central LA. 
I feel if I would have had like somebody even just give me an opportunity to show me something different that it could have made a difference in my life. That's why I'm so passionate about what I do. Like whatever you're going through, you can always channel that energy into skateboarding. It's your place away from everything. You can make it out the hood, but you gotta go back. To go back to North Philly, where our family is, it was beautiful. They deserve a chance too. We from the dirtiest blocks in Philadelphia, and we had to skate through these blocks and get laughed at. And now we good, yo. Stevie built his legacy from nothing. He takes that for those that come from nothing like real serious, you know? Steve Williams trailblazed for so many people that didn't have a voice, minority skaters, African-American skaters. Steve represents the underdog, he represents the guy that's in the last of the line. In my eyes, his legacy is already here, you know? He really made an impact and paved the way, especially for other black skaters out there. Stevie's legacy in skateboarding is massive, and I think it's only going to grow. Myself, Van VGK, is always there as a foundation for skaters like me that come from the inner city. DGK going on 20 years. I want to do it for another 20 years.